Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you all so much for coming to tonight's uh, symposium on Booty Candy by uh, Robert O'Hara. Um, uh, my name is Adam Greenfield. I'm the director of New Play Development here at Playwrights Horizons, and I'm very thr uh, thrilled to be welcoming you. Um, we, uh, Playwrights Horizons is a writer's theater. We're dedicated to the development, support, and advocacy of living American playwrights. And so uh, being a writer's theater, it's really important for us to um, really place the writer at the center of the process, which is why we created this discussion series, which is curated um, by the playwright. Um, who better than the playwright? The playwright to uh, open up the conversation about his or her work. Um, so, uh, so thank you all for being part of it. And uh, we are live streaming this from that camera over there. So if we all wave at the camera, everyone will at home will wave back. Um, and then also it'll be on our website. So if you feel like watching it again and again and again, um, you can do that from the comfort of your home. Um, so <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to turn it over to the panelists to um, have the conversation without without me. Um, uh, so um, first, uh, on the on the farthest to your right is uh, Yoruba Richin. Uh, Yoruba is a Richin. Uh, Yoruba is a uh, documentary filmmaker who has directed and produced films in the U.S. and abroad. Her latest film, The New Black, tells the story of how the African American community is grappling with gay rights in light of recent gay marriage, the recent gay marriage movement, and the fight over civil rights. Um, you can catch screenings of the play. I think there's two of them this week, in fact. Um, uh, I'm sorry, of the film. Sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, um, one on one Wednesday at CUNY, and one on Thursday um, at the Maisel Center in Harlem. And uh, there's information on that um, on the New Blacks website. Um, to Yoruba's right is Billy Porter. Billy Porter is a Tony and Grammy, Grammy Award winning singer, composer, actor, playwright, professor, and director. Um, uh, slash, Bill slash, slash, slash. Slash, 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 <laughs> slash. Uh, uh, Billy won a Tony Award and a Drama Desk Award for his performance as Lola in Kinky Boots. And uh, this fall, Primary Stages will premiere his play, um, While I Yet Live. Um, to Billy's right is Carmen Neely. Carmen currently works for the New York City Department of Education. In 1999, she founded Crucial Arts Productions, which uh, is a nonprofit that presents critical issues to the community via documentary films. And Carmen is the president and co-founder of Harlem Pride, which she co-founded in 2010. And uh, to Carmen's right is Robert O'Hara, who is a playwright and a director of many, 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 many plays, of course, including Booty Candy, um, which is running right now on this very stage and which is the reason that we're all here. Um, so uh, I'd like to turn this over to Robert to start the conversation. And in about 45 minutes or so, I'll, I'll um, sneakily interrupt them and uh, open the conversation up to questions from you guys. Um, so thanks so much, and um, take it away. Uh. So, you know, um, <laughs> when Adam told me about this panel that I got to put together, I was like, you know, uh, I don't like to talk in front of audiences. Uh, <laughs> and he said, but you can have whoever you, you want. And I was like, okay, so we're just gonna talk and uh, it might get, go wherever it's going to go, right? I, uh, I'm very good friends with Billy. I haven't seen him in a while, so we might get off topic a bit. <laughs> uh, but it is one, wonderful to meet Yoruba and Carmen. Um, so the, the first thing, we were talking actually earlier about uh, the fact that Billy has a play uh, that's opening up the street, uh, and I have this play that's opening up the street, and uh, that, uh, dealing with homosexuality and dealing with African-American issues and what have you, and just how interesting that is, uh, 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 that is happening. And so the first question I had for Billy and also for, uh, for anyone who wants to speak, um, you know, there's been this sort of, um, there's all this excitement around the new Black Phantom, you know, the new Black Cinderella. We had a, a Black uh, uh, um, um, Street Corner named Desire, uh, and and so first black lead drag queen in a commercial musical on Broadway. Yes. <laughs> that ain't never happened before either. Right. And Tony Award winning. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering, because I have mixed feelings about it, and that there is a lot of celebration of that, 
and there's no discussion of why weren't we there before and why did it take 20 years for someone to put a black mask, a mask on a black man and call him a Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> uh, and I just wanted to start that out with like, you know, because I think it's wonderful that it's happening, but it's also important that we realize that it has not happened for, for so long, you know. Um, anybody want to respond to that? Um, I agree. You know, I think that it's been, you know, I always try to take the positive side to every story and the positive side to every journey mm. because it's important to remain active in that way. But simultaneously, I do feel like the conversation about why it hasn't happened before this needs to actually be broached. Mm. And it's interesting to me because I don't know, I don't have the answer to that. Um, you know, I do know that I am a product of living inside of the rejection of that, you know, and being told flat out that I can't do something right. because that's not the story we're telling. Mm -hmm. um, and you look at the piece and you look at the material and you go, okay, there's nothing in this story that says that this, the person, the actor playing this character needs to be white, mm -hmm. other than the fact that it's always been done that way in the past. That's the only reason, you know? So there is, I, I am thrilled that we get to be a part of cracking that glass ceiling that has existed for a really long time and still does, mm. but we're cracking it. Right. And that's the positive side of it. You know what I mean? Right, right now. Yeah, go ahead. We're cracking it, but there's another level that hasn't been cracked. Absolutely. And you know, and I speak especially from the the film world, yes. uh, both documentary and 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 fiction film. Um, we have an epidemic of what I think is an epidemic of our stories not being told by us. Now, of course, you you sitting here are living proof that you know we can do it and be successful, but. Um, there are, you know, over and over and over again, I talk about this with my colleagues, these stories, they'll cast us, but we have no directorial control and, or no, and they're not writing it. No creative control. You know, you look at the James Brown movie. Mm. Not one black creative person on that movie. The James Brown documentary. You know, so there is a, a level that they'll, they'll, start, they'll cast us, they'll put us in, you know, but we have to take directorial and writing control, which of course, you know, you guys are testament to, to it happening. And I think it may happen more easily in theater than, than in film and in television. And even in, um, even in, you know, stories, shows like Orange is the New Black, for example, that, you know, that I watch, I enjoy, I think it's got amazing multiracial stories and characters, but I don't know if there are any people of color writing that mm. or directing that. Mm. And I think that that makes a difference in terms of the stories that uh, you know that we see. Mm. Right, right. I think another issue too, coming from an educator's perspective, I teach middle school, and a lot of the students think this is how things have always been. So what gets lost for them is the history and the struggle that came before all of this. Mm. So I remember we were uh, talking about a raisin in the sun. And one of the kids said, so you mean Kanye West and Kim Kardashian couldn't be in a relationship? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> actually, no. no <laughs> That's a great example, but can we focus on the theme here? But that was the question. So they, they, their minds are blown. Mm. So while they're consumers of this media, whether it be film or plays, television, et cetera, they also need to understand the history of the struggle to get where we are and not assume that it's just always been this way. So I always think that's important for yeah. us to come back to making sure that generations now and to come understand the history of it mm. so they can really fully appreciate what they see. Mm. Billy, do you want to follow up? Yeah, I just, you know, in terms of us writing our own stories, I'm going to be 45 in a week. And I know that I'm a generation, I'm from a generation of people that was taught early on to be a brilliant interpreter of other people's material. Mm. That's what I was taught. That's mm. just what you were taught. That was the pre, 
you know, internet generation. It's not like that now. You know, th these kids, which I love, but th the kids today are taught early on, the voice comes from you. Mm -hmm. The voice should come from you. There are a lot more people who have that in their ear. And I'm appreciative of that. You know, it wasn't until I got old enough and realized that my friends who were writers, who were white, who were successful, didn't actually have the knowledge or the access to actually truly write my story. And it wasn't until I stopped expecting them to do it right. and did it myself right. that then the story actually began to get told. So, you know, I, I just wanted to say that in terms of my experience, it took me gathering and gaining that understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, the understanding of, oh, wait a minute, wait, I, maybe I should, you know what I mean? Absolutely. And it's a risk, and it's a, and it's a, and it's scary. You know, especially for somebody who's, who's a performer. I was a performer only, for many, 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 many years, and I stepped out on faith to be a writer because I couldn't get no work. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. <laughs> you know, it's like, right. you know, oh, you wrote a play. Oh, you. I listen. If I was successful, like I thought I was entitled to be because I was talented and fierce and all of those things. You know, if I had sat on that, I, if it had turned out the way that I had, that I thought it was supposed to be, I don't know that I would be in this place right now. Mm -hmm. The best thing that happened to me was that they said, mm, that's not the story we're telling. Right. Because it forced me to actually go, oh, you're really not gonna hire me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You're really not going to hire me, no matter how good I am, no matter how hard I try. You're really not going to do it. Okay. Right. Now what do you do? Right. Right. Because you'll either figure it out and create something for yourself, or you'll be living on the streets. Right. So. I want to also, uh, there's something that's connected to this for me, is that, you know, the image of homosexuality and, uh, when, uh, you know, there, the once again, there was a, a lot of hoopla over the sort of, you know, uh, gays being on television and gays being, uh, you know, allowed to be out and be in, in, in different parts of media, people coming out. And so there's the idea, there's, this is twofold. And um, one is that I think that when most people hear gay, they think of a white guy. You know what I mean? And so people go, oh, but you're on, you know, Will and Grace, or you're on, it's like, the examples still don't look like me. Right. You know what I mean? It's right. still just more white people on stage. Right, right. And more white people on, ta on, on film. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, but I'm wondering what is the, the connection, or do you find that there's a connection in common, this is particularly for you, um, in terms of the homophobia, the blatant homophobia, and the blatant, uh, you know, uh, um, violence. Uh, that is happening. I mean, just in the village, you know, Randy yeah, yeah. uh, getting knocked in his face, you know, and like uh, it's sort of like the blatant acts of violence. Is that connected to the blatant acts of coming out and being visible? Um, I think so, absolutely. I mean, for instance, just with Harlem Pride, the organization, we are so successful because we're filling a void in the community mm -hmm. that even we ourselves didn't recognize how deep it ran until we actually did the first event and had over 3,000 people. Mm. Now, what event just turns out to be a block party and gets over 3,000 people the first year? So therein lies the crux of really what's going on. In terms of the violence, definitely, I think some people are, how dare they have the audacity to stand up and be themselves. Right. And therein lies anger. I mean, even on a personal level, my father sometimes still gets angry. Because he looks and like, oh, my God, I can't believe she's a lesbian. Mm -hmm. Well, gee, Dad, sorry to <laughs> disappoint you. But that's what the truth is. And right. so now when we stand up in our truth and we're strong and confident in it, some people just feel like it's in their face. Right. It's not necessarily in their face, but that's how they feel. And their re reaction is very violent. Mm. So I think that's what perpetuates itself. And we see more of it because we are starting to see beyond the will and grace, at least us telling some of our stories mm -hmm. and putting them out there and being very successful, mm -hmm. clearly, at telling our stories. So the more I, I feel, the more there's the for us, by us, about us theme that goes on, mm -hmm. the more we are seeing somewhat as being militant, maybe mm -hmm. uppity, that whole sort of thing that harkens back to the uh, civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. How dare you think you should sit at the same table? 
And so because we have that, I feel the violence does perpetuate itself and does continue. Now, what do we do about that? I think we continue to stand up and be proud because at the end of the day, what else can we do? All right. You had a quote that you said something that, it, you know, that gay rights uh, is the last, what, what was it, the bastion of civil rights? Well, there was something interesting that I, I, I'm I had. I'm not sure heard. exactly which quote you're talking about, but <laughs> whichever <laughs> one you would like to pick the, out. The what I explore in my film is how um, these activists, really, that I am, um, that I that I show working for this marriage equality bill in Maryland, and also dealing with it in their personal lives, see civil rights as the uh, gay or LGBT rights as the next, ex the natural extension. Of, of, of the freedom movement, of the civil rights freedom movement. And so people will often ask me, you know, well, do you think it's the same thing? You know, it's, I, I've been work, I worked on this film for, for three, four years, you know, and so much changed during that time, which is amazing to capture. And people all, often ask me, you know, do you think it's the same thing? And it's like, you know what, I actually, don't, that's not the question that I think is interesting. I think what's interesting is how the freedom movements, um, you know, are, are on top of each other and learn from each other and inspired by each other. And I think that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what, especially these young folks that I profiled, and not just young folks, but you know, these activists, these people working for marriage equality, for um, gender, you know, for, um, to end uh, gender discrimination, um, you know, are, see it like that. And whether we agree, kind of, even me being older at 42, it kind of doesn't matter because that's what where the momentum is. Um, so mm. that's what I see. But can I say also one other yeah. thing? Because that the I just have to say, Robert, part of the reason why I was so happy to be on this panel uh, is that I saw your play Insurrection in San Francisco oh. in um, in 1990. We don't have to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. Long time ago. <laughs> It was a time when I was sort of figuring out what I wanted to do with my life in terms of artistically, in terms of social issue, um, and seeing that play. And I, I talked about it for years. Mm. Um, and the, the, how inspiring and funny and biting and clever it was. And this, this idea or this portrayal of, of, gay, of blackness and of homosexuality and iconoclastic. Um, it was so, you know, it really set me, I think, on that path of, oh, you can actually do this kind of work and, and break barriers and portray our people in the, in the full complexity that we are. So mm. it, I think that that's also what, I and mean, you're like a pioneer for that for me. Um, I think of George C. Wolfe with the Colored Museum, which mm. I saw as a kid, also a pioneer. So it's, it's a trajectory, it's history, it's understanding, you know, um, and, and each of us, generationally break those barriers. And I, I think that your, you know, your work is part of that, so. Mm. Well, you, well, you know, that's interesting because it goes back to the sort of, you find, when you find someone that, or you find a piece of work that sort of you can identify that, you know, when, through all of the whatever is in front of you constantly. And for instance, I remember Billy on Star Search. And, mm -hmm. you know, and just knowing that there, I, I never thinking I would be sitting at a table in New York City on 42nd Street with this person, but finding that even, even though it, I didn't know what it was, I knew there was something special there, you know, and I can identify with being special, you know, even if that meant different in, in, in other people's eyes. Um, did you want to say something about that? Um, no, we can move on to the okay. next question. No, she said uh, it all. So <laughs> the other thing is that, you know, um, Booty Candy being at this theater, at Playwrights Horizons, at Playwrights Horizons, but being on 42nd Street, and of course, I remember 42nd Street. <laughs> and, you know, uh, it wasn't cute. And, uh, and, and, and people say to me, oh my God, I'm so excited that, and it is so, you know, you're so brave to, to do booty, I'm like, there's these sex clubs up and down the street and porno things and all this and stuff, but this being myself means that somehow I'm being brave or something, uh, which is sort of amazing to me. And I can imagine, uh, you know, um, that in each way, we are sort of leaders in a way. And so how, when I'm still looking to, you know, <laughs> to find myself 
in, in places. How does it feel to be considered, a, as you say, a pioneer or to be a leader? You know, I'm sure there are people who, when was the last time someone like you won the Tony Award for a Best Actor? You know what I mean? And what that must mean to, exactly. There's been three of us in the history. In the history. In the history of the whole thing, maybe four, maybe four. In the history of all of the Tony Awards, for all the years that it's existed. For singing and dancing. Yeah. Three black people. Uh-huh. Singing and dancing. <laughs> Three black people. And I'm talking about best actor. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm talking about best actor in a musical. Yeah. There have been a few more in best supporting. Yes. Right. There have been lots of ladies. Yes. You know, more ladies because it's, it's a more, it's a more um, female-centric art form, mm -hmm. you know, leading ladies in musicals. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, and it's, no playwright, no playwrights. playwrights. Yeah, you I don't know, remember a it's been it's August Wilson. Yes, right. August yes. Wilson for Fences. Once, yes. yeah, won twice. I think he won twice. And but certainly been nominated. Susan has yeah. been nominated. Susan has yeah. been nominated. You know, I, it's really interesting to me because I don't, I can't live in the world of I'm a pioneer. I live in the world of. I almost was destroyed mm. by the pressure to live the lie. To live the lie of from the moment that we can comprehend anything, the message is you're not okay and fix it. Those might not be the explicit words, but that is the action. You're not okay and fix it. So you learn to put a, a, another layer of something over your true self to make everybody around you feel comfortable. Right. Never mind yourself. Everybody around you feels comfortable, so you're okay. So you learn how to do that. But then, but you have this bursting talent. But you're, but you're, and, and you're an artist, right? And you have to express yourself. And the only thing about expressing yourself, the only thing that matters is the truth. So you can't get to the actual true expression of yourself and taking on the veil of something else because the base that you have is a lie. Hmm. So now your work isn't any good. Hmm. Because you're coming from a place of lying. Because that's the only thing that people can accept from you. So it's not until the breakdown of that happens. Right. And you can boldly say, well, if the truth of who I am means I never step foot on a stage again, so be it. If it means I never work again, doing the thing I love, I choose my sanity, over my fame and we'll let the chips fall where they may. And I think that's what each one of us up here has done in some way, yeah. you know? So I didn't, you know, I walked away from the business mm. because, it, because it was either, it was either I was gonna lose my mind or <laughs> not. Like it literally came down to that, you know? So the journey of, 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 uh, of being inside of that truth and speaking a story and developing stories that you know in your heart nobody wants to hear. But they That's do. The, it, they, but do. they do. They do. Right. But in your heart and what you were taught, right. you, we yeah. were told nobody, nobody wants, wants to hear that. The whole mainstream yeah. sort of thing. If you if you do that, you will not be successful. Right. How period. can you be? Right. How can you write a play about homosexuals black and black folks? Black, black Christian homosexuals. homosexuals. Right. <laughs> and then living with that fear. Because right. that whole fear is what just holds you back when you let it go. Essentially, the world opens up because you don't matter. What's out there doesn't matter as much as what's in yeah. here does. Yeah. You know, I came to the, I, I can't, I'm sorry, baby. I came to the, um, at the crossroads of my life, the question, what do you want? You know, and, I, and Stu, Stu says it best in Passing Strange. 
he says something about, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say it right, but I built my, um, you know, my total, my total existence is based on the decisions of a 16-year-old or something like mm. that, he says in the play. Mm. Um, and you have to grow up at a certain point. And so when I think about it, it's like all of my dreams were based on decisions that I had created as, 11, as an 11-year-old. So at 11, I knew, oh, if I'm a superstar, then I'll be on the cover of magazines, I'll have lots of money, I'll be really successful, and the people who I love will no longer reject me. That's why I wanted to be a star, mm. not for any other reason. You know, so then the question had, you know, so then the question had to morph into, wait, what is, what is it? You know, what do I really, really, really want? And I got specific and I was watching Oprah one day as I want to do. <laughs> and somebody said, service. How can you be of service? How can you be of service? And I asked myself that question. How can I be of service? How can I be of service to something other than my own ego and bank account? In a business that's inherently narcissistic. How do you do that? And that was the truth. I got to tell the truth, no matter whether anybody wants to hear it or not. Right. You know. Yoruba. I was just going to say the thing of they don't want to hear our stories. You know, we've been told that, you know, we're not going to get an audience. Yeah. There's no, no, no funding for it. There's no one's interested. And I think all of our experience belie that. I mean, that's, yeah. Yeah. we've been told lies, yes. essentially. Yes. You know, and even if you look at, what was the, the biggest box office this week? No good deed. Right. You know, <laughs> beat out, you know, Dolphins 2 or something, you know? And it's like there is a hunger to see our, and that's just having, I don't, I haven't seen the film. I think it's just having black actors like Idris and Taraj in it. People, you know, they have an audience. We have audiences. And they, and what I found in showing the film, and uh, I think Ava DuVarnay, the great female director, mm. producer, distributor, uh, she said there are, at some panel that I saw her, said there are riches in niches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there mm -hmm. are, we can create stories that people, that our people want to see and that ultimately are universal right. because mm -hmm. we're artists and so we are telling universal stories mm -hmm. and it's our job to make those, make it universal. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, they'll still say there's no audience for that and that's a lie. Mm -hmm. Right. And it people, is a lie. Yeah, people are thirsty. I mean, with Harlem Pride. Initially, myself and a co-founder who owns an art gallery, he always had a, an exhibit to celebrate pride. And we were trying to figure out how to promote it. And this particular exhibit was erotica. So instead of the mm. typical wine and cheese reception, I said, you know, we should have a party, throw some house <laughs> music in there, and have the kids come out. So we were about this, and we do a little logo. I put the logo on the shirt. I'm going to different restaurants and my regular hangouts. And people are starting to say, hey, what's this Harlem Pride? They see the colors, rainbow colors. Mm -hmm. you know. So I tell them what it's about. It's about you know, some of Harlem same gender loving LGBT people coming together to have this event. Next thing we know, the event actually happens. Initially, it's a block party. <laughs> Just one block, 3,000 people. We had politicians, we had the newspaper. We, that's when it got, we had the newspaper. We, that's when it got real. Because then we realized we had a niche, yeah. right? People were thirsty, mm. and we ourselves were thirsty, but we just didn't even recognize the need as well. You know, the thirst, you could be thirst for something you want, but there was a, just a vindicated need there. And that's how we've grown so much in five years. And then we had shade, and you know, you're gonna get shade. People, oh, you're trying to compete with downtown. No, really, we didn't even think about downtown yeah. when we put it together. It was really not a thought. Well, why is it the same weekend? Well, the Block Association had that weekend and already had the permit. So that's why it was that weekend. And we just kept it, happenstance. But people want to throw their own little, right. you know, wrenches into the mix to try to make it something that is not. Right. But that's what happens. People are hungry. They're hungry yeah. for their stories and they're hungry to be validated and to see themselves outside of themselves, to know that there's community there. And, and that's, again, what art does. It builds community. It helps you see yourself outside of yourself. Yeah. You know, um, so they want me to allow you all, before we allow the audience, to ask me any questions that you had. You all have seen uh, the play. And so I'm particularly interested, and if, you know, I don't know if I, I was watching it the other night, and I was saying to myself, I don't think I've seen two black lesbians on the stage, black lesbians on the stage uh, before. And I'm sure I must have in some way. 
but I don't know what play requires two people to play lesbians. And even though it is a scene that is completely and totally ridiculous, most, <laughs> you know, most of the play is ridiculous, but the fact that they exist, uh, in space, in front of someone, was sort of interesting. So I'll just throw it out as to uh, open up if you, there's anything you guys want to comment on or ask me about before we go to the audience. Yes. I'll, I'll start. Um, so kind of two, uh, let's see if I can weave two into one. Um, I first, as I said, I first saw uh, your play in the uh, Insurrection in the 90s and, and you were at Columbia, you went to Columbia, yes. right? So I remember reading about you and, cu and curious that you chose directing. You were in the directing yes. school, right? So I'm curious just a little bit about your trajectory and how you came there. And then also you just said, I mean, the play was hilarious. It was outrageous. I think in the poll quote, we got to said it's to offend, amuse. <laughs> it was like all these things. I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's actually right. That's actually what it did. But you said it was ridiculous, you know. And how did you, like, how did you choose that, these vignettes, these, like, why this fo format, this way of telling the story? Well, you know, as, as Billy and I was talking that, you know, I was incredibly influenced, especially for this play on uh, George Wolfe's uh, Color Museum. Mm. Uh, and, and Billy, you're going to direct at the Huntington. Yes, I'm directing uh, that at the Huntington in the winter. Yeah. And it was just a profound, it was the first time I saw a black gay person on stage, and he was not having it. Yeah. Right? And, it, and he was Not a victim. No. It, it, and, you know, and it was snapping and all this stuff. And I actually... Um, um, a little known fact, played the character in college uh, horribly. But, uh, <laughs> but that was profound. So, you know, I think that the Booty Cannon began with a sort of series of, I, I had been writing short, you know, as a writer, you sort of write a little scene or you write a little play and you put it away or whatever. Or someone goes, uh, can you write me a little scene or you're commissioned to write a 10 minute play. And so some of those happened that way. And so uh, one night I put uh, uh, an evening of theater uh, of uh, short plays of mine. Uh, and they had all been, like, you know, some of them had been done by other people. Like, I wrote a monologue for an actor who said, I need an audition monologue. And so, about five years ago, one of the, uh, uh, artist the artistic directors uh, of the Woolly Mammoth in D.C. said, you know, I read those, that collection of plays, you know, and I, um, I think that there's some characters in it that might be interesting to mm. pull forward. And I was like, well, they were all written at various times for various reasons, and I don't think that they work that way. Uh, he said, well, why don't you take a look? And so I took a look, and I sort of threw half of them out. And there were a handful of them that I sort of kept, and I sort of, and they didn't have really names to them. There was not, like, for instance, the drinks and desire scene with the two men. There was no Sutter and Roy. There was just two guys in a bar, right? And so then I began to give them biographies uh, and connect them to each other and then write whole other uh, pieces of, of the play and rewrite them, whatever. And so that's what came of it. And only because, you know, I knew that you could do that from Colored Museum because my trainee would have told me that you can't. My trainee would have told me that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. That that, in fact, was not a play. It was a bunch of vignettes, you know, and that you couldn't weave a nonlinear story. That it was more of experience and not a narrative, you know. And so I tried at the end of the first act to rip any sort of uh, semblance of a narrative away from the audience by examining the pieces as individuals and saying, you know, uh, as I said before in a talkback set, I didn't want audiences to leave the uh, intermission and go, well, I wonder if, you know, they're going to fall in love or I wonder if she's going to have that baby or whatever. I, I want them to go, I have no idea what's going to happen next, <laughs> you know, and, and sit inside that, yeah. you know what I mean? So that's where that came from. As for, you know, my uh, Columbia days, uh, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and my grandmother had 12 kids, kids. And my mother was the oldest daughter. And so uh, I was one of the older grandsons. And so most of my aunts and uncles were teenagers as I was growing up. And they were out of control, right? And I was three. And teenagers say horrible things to kids, right? And they don't think of them as your uncle. They think of me as, you know, the little kid, right? And I was a feminine. And I was uh, saying and danced and wrote stories and what have you. So, the, you know, I learned very early to sort of toughen my skin and sort of use my, my power of my language. Uh, and also I was uh, being highly educated because I, I loved school. Uh, and uh, so I began to sort of like uh, have this sort of relationship to language. And I uh, went to college and I never thought I would be an, uh, an artist. I thought that was a hobby. I just wrote those plays or whatever as a kid. Um, and then I realized that you could be an artist, and I applied to Columbia, and 
you know, I came to Col the story is I came to Columbia. They said uh, for my interview, and they said, you know what, you're one of our top candidates for the directing program. I applied for the directing and the writing program, and you're one of the top candidates for the directing program. And I was like, oh great. And so then I went back to college, and I was like, you know what, I'm not going to take this class anymore. I'm going to Columbia, and I'll take Spanish at Columbia. And the next week, I got a rejection letter. And I remember one of the, uh, uh, my uh, counselors in high school saying that if you get a rejection letter, you should call them up and tell them that you're really interested and maybe you can be gonna put, put on a wait list. So I called Columbia up and they were like, um, hi Robert, and I was like, hi. And I was like, you know, when I was there, you said I was one of your top candidates and now I got a rejection letter, what's up with that? And they're like, hold on for a second. And the dean got on and said, we, we sent you the wrong letter. <laughs> <laughs> And that you really got into the directing program. We haven't decided on the playwriting program yet, but you and you've got it. But but you uh, you definitely got in. You'll be hearing. To this day, all I have is a rejection letter from Columbia. <laughs> and so I showed up, wow. and and it was like, oh, I'm here. And they had been sending me financial aid stuff, so that's how that became. You know, yeah. Wow. Did you have a question? Wow. And so, Billy, I want you to talk about your, because we were talking, you said something about how we, we wrote the same play in a way, and that, you know, my play is a, is a, a satire. Yeah, we, we, you know, we met, what? You don't have to go into it. A long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> we met a long time ago, and I've always, always, always been a fan of um, Robert's work, and Robert was one of the people that actually, you know, I looked to as an example of someone who could develop and create their own work when I was trying to find the courage to do that myself. Um, so with that said, I came to see the, I, you know, I wrote While I Yet Live, we're in rehearsals. It's about my life, you know, black, gay, Christian, I'm living in America, trying to make it work. Um, you know, themes of abuse, themes of rejection, themes of forgiveness, things of, you know, just the power of all of those things. And all of that is in this play. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't know. I mean, I read a little bit of it, but then I had to go into rewrites for my own play, and I knew this was being produced, so I was like, I'll see it. Um, but it started, and I just thought, oh, my God. It's literally, thematically, exactly the same. Mm. How we approach it is real, real different. Mm. You know, my approach is more kitchen sink drama-ish, mm -hmm. and you've gone full satire, <laughs> which, is, which is so remarkable that the same type of themes can exist in all of these different ways, and that was what was so exciting about it, was that it felt like the marginalization of the community and how there's only one version right. yeah. of us. Yeah. Right. You know, it's like sometimes there's a breakthrough, but then it's one thing, you know? And so the experience is one thing. And if you don't fit into that one thing that the black people are doing, then once again, you're out of work. Right. You know, so <laughs> it was so interesting to come and see those themes expressed in a completely <laughs> different mm. way. You know, and I also got, you know, I watch it and I was like, it's not all, you know, pom-poms and <laughs> powder puffs. <laughs> it really isn't. You know, it gets really, really, really dark mm. for those of us who know what that darkness oh, is yeah, and who are yeah. willing to go into that darkness with you. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? And mm. you do it with such sleight of hand, and you do it with such grace, and you make everybody feel comfortable about it, which is mm -hmm. one of our jobs, mm -hmm. you know, because if people want to run out of the theater, then we're not doing our job. Right. So you do have to take care of your audience simultaneously mm. at the same time challenging mm -hmm. them. Right. And you do that with such, you know, it's like I don't even know that people are, finesse. you know, it's such finesse. You know, but it was it was powerful. It was such a wonderfully, it hit me. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. It hit me in such a great, wonderful way. And it's exciting. And it made me, you know, breathe again because I haven't really been breathing. Because um, I know my play starts performances next Wednesday, so I haven't been breathing much. Mm -hmm. um, it was great. I slept really good last night. So thank you. Carmen, <laughs> you have any All right. Right. <laughs>
my question is this. Well, first, I have to say the preacher scene, because mm -hmm. I'm a PK. Mm -hmm. Loved it. I think every LGBT, same gender loving preacher's kid should see that and feel okay. Mm -hmm. Love that scene. But let's go into the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> now, the scene that made me choke yeah. to use that, I like that though. I, before seeing the play, my girlfriend and I were talking about just the types of plays we like versus musicals, mm. and I was I like those ones that kind of grip you. Mm. I got gripped. Mm. And so the scene that I'm referring to is the one where the guy is drunk and they go back to the hotel mm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. wonder what was the underlying inspiration, shall I say, for how did that scene develop? Because that scene, after seeing the intermission with the, with the panel and, and loving that, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, when we're on these different panels. <laughs> oh, right. you know, you're supposed to be the voice for the black right. community. Right. And I'm just one person. Right. And the, the community is so diverse. So after seeing that, I think that set the tone, at least for me, right. going into the second act. And so then when we got to that space, I was just like, it made me uncomfortable. But right. again, I wasn't running out of the theater. Right. And I felt that that discomfort was, there was a point to it. Yeah. And there ensued a debate after seeing the, not so much debate, but conversation after seeing the play mm -hmm. between myself and my girlfriend, like just what did that mean? So I'd like to ask you, what did that mean? Well, mm -hmm. you know, all of the scenes come from some sort of real fact of my life and mm -hmm. some sort of experience. So there was an experience where I was in a bar with a very good friend of mine, and there was a straight guy that came up, that came up and just, you know, as straight men think that they can do, and just interrupt your space. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and, and was like, wait a second, are you different? Are you gay and whatever? And I was like, you know what? I I was tipsy and my friend was tipsy and so we began to play with this person and then we realized that this person was actually uh, dealing with a lot more than mm. just being drunk mm. and so that's where I took off as a, as a writer and it's like what if we had gone the extra level and this had gone whatever and so you know uh, in terms of booty candy it, it is about uh, uh, how one deals with rejection and I was thinking I have friends that you know will burn down a person's house, you know <laughs> what I mean? Call up every person they ever been with. And just so, that I think that Sutter was sort of trying to deal with his own rejection. And I think also the title of the scene is called The Last Gay Play, which refers, of course, to George Wolfe's um, The Last Mama on the Couch play. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, um, there was always happy homosexuals, you know? And we're always either, you know, on the verge of realizing something and then either going to kill ourselves or going to sing a song or going to uh, sit in a corner and, and have the lights go out on us as we ponder, right? Uh, and so this was like, what if, you know, uh, there was a, a homosexual who could not deal with the rejection that he had gotten earlier? from the same actor playing the characters in his life. Right. So that was an example. And so therefore, the, uh, the actors began to turn on him. Uh, and the character, his characters began to turn on him uh, at the end of the scene and say, this is too much. And so it really was an example of if I were to put a rewrite on the stage. You know? mm. And so that's why I, I say that if he had said, you know, I, I want this to happen and this happened, three of the characters would instantly disappear. Right. from the stage. Okay. So it was an example of, of going too far and then having to ha turn around and look at what you had done. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So mm -hmm. that's what that was, actually. Loved it. Loved Where it. are we, Adam? Um, <laughs> I, uh, well, I think we're at the end of the question. Um, so we are, uh, well, Claire's Rise is a nonprofit, and among many other things, what that means is that we have exactly one microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's that we all have to share. So um, uh, we have about 20 minutes, and um, uh, we'll... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, if you raise, raise your hands, we'll, uh, we'll pass the microphone to you. you can, if you can ask the question in the microphone, that'd be great. And then we'll okay, because we're live streaming. We're going to take the microphone from you after that. <clears throat> um, so uh, anybody have any questions for Robert or for the panel? Are you guys not disappointed that this is a white audience, a white middle-aged audience? I'm done being disappointed. Me too. <laughs> that does not help me sleep at all. That doesn't, be. that doesn't. It's not all white. It doesn't make any, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> so no, no, I'm not. And not anxious to try and attract more black people of course. into the theater. Always anxious and always doing that. Always setting out to do that. You know, but it's something that is ever evolving. And it takes patience and it takes time. That's where I am. I don't know about the rest of you. And you know, I think that the black people who I know, I know several of the people of color, 
in the room, actually. Yeah, uh, not, so yeah. uh, I think that the people who are here want to be here. I don't want people yeah. here that don't want to be here. So yeah. uh, I'm grateful that you're here, you know. Uh, yeah, is anyone else? Yeah, well, I'm certainly grateful. I think uh, diversity is good. And I think having this conversation and actually having some of our opinions and thoughts and ideas being heard by you all is a positive thing. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, we saw you play in previews. Yes. And I couldn't stop laughing. I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> Thank and you. I was very happy when the New York critics reviewed it so mm. well. And mm. I'm wondering, I didn't know what they would do. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> but congratulations. Thank you. And I have to tell you that I quote lines from the play to people all the time. And which I say, one? Yeah, what's your favorite line? I want to know which one. Yeah. I want to know which one. Uh, the two women having the conversation about naming the baby genitalia. <laughs> <laughs> and I always think, well, if you if you like this line, you'll like this play, but if you don't, it's not for you. Mm. It always gets a laugh. Right. It's terrific. Sometimes Thank silliness you. is just silly and funny. You know, it doesn't have a racial barrier uh, if it's just silly and funny. And that's also, you know, the whole idea is that you laugh until you choke, right? And so you, I, I, I deliberately put stuff in so that I can get you thinking a certain way, you know, and then go this, and then we do a sharp turn. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, as a white person, yes. how do I gently and discreetly interest the black people I know in theater? Ooh. Ooh. Interest them to coming to the theater? Yeah, to, to come in a, in any capacity. How do I get You could buy them a ticket. Oh. <laughs> Because it's very expensive. I would buy them all a ticket, but I'm afraid they wouldn't it come. Wouldn't be well, I don't know how it would be received. I'd be glad to buy them tickets. I think you should. You, you, should, should, buy I, you should buy them a ticket. Yeah. And say, so I have bought you a ticket. You have no excuse now. Come you to this play. You have to see play. Booty Candy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to see Booty Candy. And you have to see his play. Yeah. And you have to see While I Yet Live. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And what's so wonderful about it is that you know. Uh, there's room for him and me and 900 other of us. Yeah, all you have to do is look up and down Broadway and you will see all these stories being told by people who look alike and who have the same reality and they're telling different stories. And so I don't see why there is any, any reason why there can't be Billy, myself, and 17,000 other stories told. And the same goes with Yoruba and her stories. Like, I think that there's this idea, as Billy was saying, that there's only a space for one at a time. And I don't think that's right. Uh, yeah. But we're seeing black people here who are interested in theater. Like, why are we ignoring the fact that exactly. there are black people of color in the audience? But she was speaking like, particularly no, her, 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 her friends. Oh, okay. Her I just want to acknowledge friends. that there are plenty of people of color here. Right. And we come to theater. I grew up in theater. You know, we, th this is, we are a part of this community. And sometimes I feel like white people don't see it. Right. Yeah. There was someone over here. Yeah. But buy her a ticket. She don't need a mic, she's an actress. <laughs> Speak up. <laughs> oh, they're live streaming it, honey. For the live stream, you have to talk on the live stream. Right. <laughs> um, but just to comment on the, the two comments that were just made, I think one of the reasons why you will see a lot of brown faces starting to um, enter the theater and be here is because that there are stories that we can see ourselves <laughs> on stage. Um, that hasn't happened for a long time. I'm a recent graduate uh, student from Yale. Um, this is a good friend of mine who just came out of a program at UNC. And one of the reasons why Booty Candy was so exciting to me, one of the reasons why Why I Let Live is so exciting is because it has brown faces. It's telling another story. I do a lot of classical theater. I didn't become interested in Shakespeare until I saw people that looked like me doing it. Mm. And now I do it <laughs> all the time. Um, I'm doing The Tempest at La Mama. All right. The 2nd to November. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Promotion! <laughs> and that's all a plug. Um, but that's why it's, it's so exciting. This panel is so exciting because it features, you know, for African Americans or brown people or black people, however you want to refer to them, it features them. 
And in that way, I, fe I feel like <laughs> I'm being featured. Um, and you, you want to come out. And these stories need to be told, and they need to be heard. So buy a ticket, because you won't know unless you offer it to somebody. You don't know how they're going to respond right. or how they're going to receive it. Um, and a lot of different people can introduce different types of people to the theater. It doesn't matter about race, you know, color, creed, religion, none of that. Um, they have stories to tell. They have truths to be heard. And I think it's all of our uh, responsibility to pay it forward in that way. So buy somebody a ticket. Support the arts. Yeah. Have a great evening. Right. Next. Get back there, Mary. Oh, hi. Um, um, hi. Uh, my name's Jeffrey Thompson, and I'm, I, first of all, I'm here uh, because I am moved by what I saw when I came to the theater uh, a, week, a week or so ago mm. to see Booty Candy. I think it's, um, it's a brilliant exploration of, of humanity. And the humanity is, is, is larger than just the people that I see on the stage. I, 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 I like uh, Europe. I fell in love with you when I saw Insurrection mm, years ago. <laughs> and uh, I thought that the, your, your ability to break through time and space and put us in, in, in unusual situations mm. at a blink of an eye mm. uh, was something that I thought was uh, uh, any playwright would be proud to be able to do what you do with that. Uh, Someone used the, de uh, the, the um, I think Billy, or someone used the term to describe how you took, how you take us in this particular play from moments of uh, hilarity to moments of deep pain mm. and, and, and extreme truth. And again, a, a shout out to all five of these amazing mm. performers who take your words and your ideas and they bring them to life in a way again that I thought was startling because each of them is so close to their own <coughs> personal truth mm. that they can take you to where you l allow them to go with the words. They allow us as an audience to go. But you do it with the words that I think one of the two of you described as grace. Mm. You have a grace in which you snatch people to places that they probably would not go if you gave them a warning of what was coming. <laughs> uh, uh, but they go there and they come back from there and you gracefully let them in and out. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted, this is a question that I have for all, for, for all of you there. Um, I'm really happy, I'm so happy to be here to see uh, uh, you, all of you extremely talented people sitting on this panel and to see the, uh, the ceilings that are getting the little splinters in them and shattering in certain ways. Uh, but it, a, a lot of times I think that with our successes come brand new ghettos. <laughs> that uh, people build for us. There's not, there's not, th there are none of you here who are speaking about issues of being both uh, African American, homosexual, who aren't also qualified to speak about any other issue that you chose to speak about. Uh, there, there. <laughs> uh, my years of being in the theater, I have never found any reluctance to any uh, Caucasian. Uh, director, producer, telling my story uh, and assuming that they have the right to tell my story and to, to write fictitious uh, versions of my story once on this island. Uh, and, and <laughs> but do you, have you all felt an embrace that if you decided to write a play uh, about a, 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 a Jewish shtetl in Poland uh, because the people in that in that story spoke to you. Mm. Have you are you finding a theater or a film world that will embrace you as writers, performers, directors outside of the 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 circle the the circle which is getting larger, thank God, in which they're comfortable letting you be seen. But are you also being do you feel that you're being welcomed in those other areas because you should be. Of course. Mm. You know, I have a play called Antebellum that um, um, Billy did a reading. That's uh, stunning. Uh, thank you, darling. And uh, you know, it is about um, a Jewish uh, um, family 
uh, in the South. Uh, and it's told uh, at the in the 1930s on the eve of uh, Gone with the Wind. And it's told at the same time as uh, another story is being told in um, Germany, uh, Berlin. Uh, and it sort of time travels back together. Um, so, you know, I have, I have learned, like Billy, it's like, you know, I can't wait for you to let me do anything. Right. I'm going to do it. And, you know, for instance, I did Booty Candy four years ago. Uh, so while it's a new play for you all, I've moved forward. Mm. And I have other things that I'm already <laughs> working on. You know what I mean? So when you are ready for that, somebody will build it and put it in there. But I can't wait for them in order to go there. You know? So uh, I, don't, I don't get calls about uh, certain things uh, because uh, I think that obviously uh, they are not interested in, or whoever they are. You wouldn't think, oh, let me call Robert O'Hara to write about the shtetl, you know. Uh, but uh, I'm a writer, and so I'll write you if you pay me. You know what I mean? Uh, anything. Uh, it doesn't. Sci-fi. I've never been to uh, back in time, and my first play had a man going back in time. Mm -hmm. You know. So I think you just have to go there as an audience, as an artist. Yeah, Billy, do you want to? Do you guys want to I, I, you know, I'm still so new in terms of what I'm writing, what I'm being produced, you know, what's being produced for me. So I don't. No, I know I did it. I created um, a review of Sondheim's music mm. uh, back in 2007. Um, that was, you know, based on the Seven Ages of Man speech from As You Like It. So we were telling the story of the circle of life from birth to death through Sondheim music, Shakespeare text, and an all-black cast, because I'm obsessed with Sondheim, and I can't get cast in none of his shows, so I made my own show. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Sondheim let you do it. Yeah, he, he worked with us. Right. He let us do it. He, you know, like, I pitched it to him. I was in his house working on my show, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and it was amazing. You know, but the experience was amazing. But, you know, the response was, questionable mm. and not because of the work but because there were audiences that were not ready for R&B soul gospel hip-hop and rap arrangements of Sondheim music not yet they were not ready so you know I don't know I, I I'm still gonna do it yeah. you know I'm still gonna continue to do my work I'm still gonna do it because I'm an artist and I have to so you know I Hopefully, mm. you know, I'll be around long enough and... So you're, and, and Carmen, you guys have done stuff that I can say that people may not be ready for it. You know, Harlem Pride, are they ready? Or, you know, you found out that the number of them were, but you had to go out on faith. You right, know, because right. you could have had five people show up. Exactly. You know. Um, initially, we, we didn't necessarily think people were ready for it. But what people really aren't ready for is our overall push right now to have a community pride center uptown. Mm. People, why do you need one uptown? There's one on 13th Street. It's in the village. Mm. Well, guess what? There We've are- We've migrated. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you were kicked out of the village a long time ago. Right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> I can't afford the village. You can't exactly. afford the village, and sometimes I'm not comfortable yeah. in the village, right. to be absolutely honest. Right. Yeah. So, you know, there is a need for cultural competence uptown. And, and I find myself, when asked, getting a slight bit angry as if there are libraries downtown. Right. Why can't we have one uptown? There, there are firehouses and police stations downtown. Right. We have those uptown. Why can't we have a center uptown? So it's, it's a question I almost don't even like to address. Right. It's just the fact we will have one. Yes. Well, it goes back to the whole thing, you know, when people would say, well, you know, um, do you have to do the gay and the black thing? <laughs> yeah. Right. Can you just leave that part? Does it have to be a gay and a black yeah. show? Once again, hide yourself. Right. Put your left arm out. Hide and yourself. come in with just your right side of your body. Right. Hide yeah, yourself. You ain't in. saying that to Jack Nicholson. <laughs> right. But there's, there is, just in terms of, you know, are they ready? Like, I, I emphatically believe that they are. Emphatically mm, believe I that do. they are. I mean, that show that you did, I literally thought, was that before Obama was elected president? Which yeah. one? The one that you, the, the Sondheim. Right, yes. right. I bet you would get a totally different 
response now. Mm -hmm. You know, it's there is oh, an know. evolution that's happening around race, around sexuality that, you know, that obviously is part of our history in this country, but has sped up in terms of looking at intersectionality around race and sexuality. And that's what I, I found with, you know, with, with my film and taking it all over the country, all over the world. Um, we're having a new conversation around this, and there's hunger for it. And, which hunger. I think, going back to Obama, which I think started with Obama, because I'm gonna yeah. tell you, yeah. when he, right before the election, when he came out and said gay marriage should happen, I, yeah. I thought for sure we would have a new president. Right. <laughs> That's right. how bad it is right. in the black community. That's how bad it is. In the black but he community, bought, he changed. He, he was, changed it. He changed it. He changed, he changed it. And I was so, like, pleasantly you know. surprised that it turned out the way that it turned out because yeah. I was sure all these black church people are done with him. Mm. But there were there was a whole coalition mm. that was formed and of course defeated. Right. But we still have issues. I'm also a member of the LGBT Faith Leaders of African Descent, mm. which is another Harlem-based organization. We still deal with certain churches, particularly in Harlem, who are not open and affirming, who still <laughs> preach fire and brimstone. Mm -hmm. And that's part of one of the reasons as a preacher's kid, you know, and I come from the holiness background. Mm. My yes, parents. me too. Woo. Pentecostal, so you know, honey, Church uh, of God in Christ. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Church of God in Christ. Yes. But you have that in the Catholic Church. But you, you have, have it's it. It's not just, right. yes. I mean, you know it's what not my, universal. I mean, it's universal in that it, sense. Exactly. But it's still a fight. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. It's still Absolutely. a fight. It's still an uphill fight, I think, at this point. And yes, it's getting easier, but it's definitely a fight, and particularly to your point, in our community. And of course, not everybody's Baptist or holiness. There are black Catholics, et cetera. Atheists. And, uh, atheists, mm. et cetera. <laughs> but it, it's still a struggle. It's still a struggle. I don't think we've made it yet. I mean, just for instance, Obama used, he's uh, evolving. Mm. So I, I go home one particular Christmas and my father who likes to talk about, who likes to talk about, oh, she's a teacher. and Oh, she did this and she did everything, but she's a lesbian. So it's like this big secret when I go home. Like don't, a Neil Simon play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's like, you know, don't, don't go to church. We're not sure if you could bring your girlfriend, all this other stuff. <laughs> it's just drama. I mean, that's the play in and of itself. But he sits me down, you know, I've been wanting to talk to you. I'm like, oh, God, okay. Your mother and I are evolving. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's good, though. No, it's good. That's but I'm good. just saying from my perspective in this whole right. thing, yeah. you're like, okay, brace yourself. Yeah. Because you just, don't know what you're going to get. Right, because right. my definition of evolving isn't necessarily right. His definition, though I respect whatever it is. Right. And everyone, I think, revolves, evolves at a different pace. Yes. Oh, is there something else? Yes. Okay, we have time for one more question. Sorry, we this got up lady. on a tangent. There. We did. Right here. Right here. <laughs> if you make it quick, you might do another one. Um, okay. As a straight white woman, I thirst for theater and other art for people who are different from me. So bring it on. I love it. I'm looking forward to following the career of all of you. And here's my question for Mr. O'Hara. I think you've got a lot of, you, you're, the play is so funny and you deal with a lot of painful stuff. You deal with stereotypes. I'm a college professor and I had an ugly incident once with some graduate students who were saying, well, like the girls with names like Shaniqua, they're mm. never gonna get yeah. jobs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And here you are with characters named Genitalia and yeah. Intifada. <laughs> and could you talk a little just about- um, Good question. I don't know, just all these choices, which I think are so wonderful and so- Well, great. I just think that there's truth in stereotypes. Mm. You know, that there's value in stereotypes. Mm. It gets us all on the same page, mm. you know, uh, especially if they're ridiculous in a way. You know, and, and if you can show how ridiculous a stereotype is, then you've sort of defeated it, right? Mm. If you can laugh at it. You know, I think that, uh, in fact, there are people with crazy, crazy. I mean, my partner is Jewish, and half his family has crazy names, you know, and they've changed them. Right. Uh, so I think I don't think it's particular to black people or any group of people, but I think that you if you get if you put a stereotype on stage, if you keep at it long enough, then you can find a truth inside it. So, you know, the, uh, the genitalia uh, stereotype is that uh, it has a ring to it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it, there's, a, there's a grace to it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to put you in your face. Right. And but. <laughs> But people, uh, and they're on the, and the, you know, they're on the phone, 
uh, and everyone has it wrong. Everyone, someone thinks she's calling it this, 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 and it's all about things that they, you, you're, not, you're not supposed to say, right? So I sort of try and play around with things that you're not supposed to say and what you're not supposed to do, and yet we all do that. We all have genitalia, you know? <laughs> so what are we hiding from? <laughs> you know? yeah. So that's where the idea of stereotypes come. I, I love to play with those things because then I can choke you with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, um, and uh, um, and uh, so we, we have to end now, but um, I just want to thank this, these panelists for a terrific thank you. Um, And I want to thank you all so much for coming out tonight to join us and be part of the conversation. Um, thank you all and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.